over a few rules uh, with you and how today will work, and then we're going to get started. So first of all, congratulations. You're all actually here. You showed up. Uh, we do have issues with some of that sometimes. Um, so uh, how many of you participated in the dry run? Okay, so you've kind of had the feel for this. If you didn't participate, I am going to take just a minute and go through uh, kind of how the process works, but I got some housekeeping things to do before we do that, and I went the wrong way, and I just wanted to thank the Graduate Coordinator Network, who are represented today as your judges. How many of you know who your Graduate Coordinator is? Okay. Well, I suggest you work on that if you don't know. And uh, the Graduate Coordinator Network is a group of professionals who are in each of the departments and they basically make or break your career at UT. So, hey, uh, they're very important. They help organize a lot of things and they're uh, instrumental in helping people graduate on time. So what I'd like to do, uh, in heats one and two, the Graduate Coordinator Network our members are serving as judges. And they also are the organization that is supplying the money for the prizes. So the first prize is $1,000, second is $750, and the People's Choice is $500 and they're paying for the airline and hotel for the winner to go to the fabulous Birmingham in March uh, to represent the university at the regional competition. So let me, I just want to have you guys say hi to everybody and, and tell them where you're from and um, anything else that you'd like for them to know so they know who the judges are. Hi, I'm Shar Burke and I work in the College of Pharmacy. I'm Beth Chichester. I work in the Department of Classics, and I have uh, judged this a few times, and I really enjoy this. So thank you for, for participating. And I'm Lacey White. I work for the Department of Biomedical Engineering. Happy to be here. Thank you all. Um, okay, so, and thank you again to the Graduate Coordinator Network. We couldn't do this without you. Uh, and thanks for everything you guys do, including serving as judges. So. Um, What's this, Danielle? Oh, this is an advertisement. Okay. <laughs> Didn't know that was coming up. So read that. Uh, participate in that. Danielle, anything you want to say about it? Yeah, we love the library, so participate in that if you can. And we can send this out if you guys would rather have it on email. So, Okay, so uh, I'm just going to do, for those of you who have, how many of you have watched our videos online? And so you know, you kind of know how this works. Good, good, good. Nobody's going to be surprised by anything today. Um, I'm not going to go through all the rules, nor am I going to go through all the judging criteria, but I am going to do some really basic talk about some basic things where people in the past may have had issues, okay? So what's going to happen is um, the first slide that's going to come up is going to have your name on it. And, I, and I, you must be in some sort of order here. Danielle probably put you in an order the way you're going. Okay, when the person finishes before you, you will come up and I'm going to put a microphone on you. I'm just going to put this around your neck. We have to have the audio feed because this is being broadcast on the internet, so we, you have to use the microphone. Okay, and, and also it helps people to hear you. So that's when you're going to come up. As soon as you're ready, I'll hit the button and your slide will come up. When that clock back there, the big three minute clock starts is when you start. You either move or you speak. Okay, All of today's talk must be in plain English spoken word. Okay, If there are things in there that are non-English, make sure they're relevant to the topic. Okay. No singing, no rapping, no visual aids, no dancing, no instruments, none of that. You will be disqualified, okay, if you do that. So it all has to be spoken word. Um, watch the clock. Do we have the bell yet? Okay, so that's a very bad sound, bad sound. You don't ever want to hear that. So when you start, the clock will start. If there's a technical problem with the clock, it doesn't start, you will hear... And that means stop. Anytime you hear the bell, just stop talking, okay? That is a pause for us to reset the clock 
and get it going. When you're up here, watch the clock. Do not go over three minutes. If it hits zero, zero, zero all the way across, you're going to hear the bell. And if you hear the bell, it's reason for disqualification. And it would be better just to stop talking. Don't finish your sentence. Just stop talking. The judges will make the final decision on that. Um, also, you want to get as close to three minutes as possible. So when you're done, the clock will stop. Our timekeepers, who are Holly and David, will actually tell the judges your time. So they'll say two minutes, 57 seconds, which is a really good time. You do not want to hear them say two minutes and 30 seconds, okay? That means you left 30 seconds on the clock and that will likely count against you, okay? So we want to make sure you use as much of your time as possible. Does anybody have questions about the rules? Okay. And then here are the judging criteria. And basically what I usually tell people about the judging criteria is be logical, be engaging, talk to your audience. It's a little wopsided today, but talk to your colleagues, talk to the judges, and they will judge you on understanding what it is that you're doing. And at the end of the day, they want to be excited about your research. They want to learn more and they want to, they actually want to, you know, stand up and clap for you. That's what, that's, that's where you want to get the judges. They're not going to, but you will want them to want to do that. Okay. Okay. And then that's some of the things I've just said. Some of that's in the rules, but you know, these are things we really want you to do, but the, these are the things that judges are looking for. Okay. Hopefully you've read these because I'm not going to spend much time on them. And I've talked about the big money, so good luck. Um, at the, we will, um, there you guys are. We will announce the winners today. So the last person is scheduled to go at 11.10. We will give the judges 45 minutes to an hour to decide. So most likely we will announce the winners today around 12.15. And the winners today will go on to the final heat tomorrow afternoon. It could, there's no set number. There could be three of you, there could be five of you, there could be seven of you. It depends on what they decide, uh, who moves to the finals, okay? All right, uh, anything I've missed? Anything, any, anybody, questions? Or are we ready to go? This will go fast, so settle in, here we go. And so let's get started. And I'm not gonna announce your name, you'll just see your name pop up. And then come on up. satellite data, you tend to think of pictures, like something you might see when you hit the satellite button on Google Maps. But modern sensors capture so much more than we see with our naked eyes, a whole continuum of wavelengths. And modern scientists use that information to analyze ecosystems, detect heat waste, and classify everything from crops to military vessels. Or they would. In an advancing technological world, data is only meaningful if it is manageable. And data like this can get too big to store, let alone process. This opens up a vital area of research called dimensionality reduction, basically making a smaller, more manageable data set that you can use as a proxy for the larger original data set. Now, there's actually a solution to this problem. The best proxy data set you can get comes from something called principal component analysis, or PCA. The problem is, how do you implement this PCA when you can't store the whole data set and you can't work with the whole data set at once? Well, my advisor and I have come up with a new algorithm that adaptively performs principal component analysis on a data stream. And to give you a sense for how that works, I want you to envision an all-you-can-eat buffet. Okay, there is an overwhelming amount of food and you only have this one small plate to be able to capture as much of the spread as you possibly can. So what do you do, right? You go down each row of food and you look at each dish and you add it sequentially to your plate. And we essentially do the same thing with something like this satellite image. We look at it pixel by pixel and update our data plate without ever having to store the entire data set in memory. 
Now, the thing that makes our algorithm particularly unique is, as I said, it is adaptive. So it takes into account what we already have on our data plate and how much each new component would change things, like you would when you're going to an all-you-can-eat buffet. The problem is, prior to my work, the standard technique was to essentially go through the buffet a thousand times with a thousand different plates, and then look at every single plate and decide which one was the best representation of your data set. That is really inefficient, and it uses way too much memory. My algorithm is much better in terms of both storage space and time because it only requires essentially one pass through our data buffet and one data plate. Now, our algorithm gets extremely close to that best case principal component analysis, but how close? And that's what my current research is trying to figure out. We are making mathematical guarantees for these solutions, and the reason why this is important is for something like a satellite image, it may be used to, I don't know, send a missile. You can't say, oh, this algorithm works most of the time. You need to know exactly how good your information is, and that's exactly what my current research is establishing. I like that you clap. That's very supportive. Very good. Thank you. So we'll wait till the judges are ready and then we'll go with the next one. So judges, whenever you're ready, you can give me the look or you can do a, one of these or whatever you think. Okay. Our judges are very quick. Whenever you're ready. Can any of us in this room imagine a life without electricity? No, right? When I go home in the evenings, I like to cook a meal on my electric stove put the dirty dishes in the dishwasher, maybe cool down my room so that I can sit and relax on my couch and watch some Netflix, or actually work on my dissertation as I'm supposed to. Maybe some of you have similar evening routines, right? But if all of us go home and do those things at about the same time in the evening, that creates the need for a lot of electricity in our homes. With population growth, urbanization, and climate change, the demand or need for electricity in homes all over the world has been increasing. To provide this electricity to customers like you and I, electric companies have to keep building new power plants to generate the electricity, as well as new power lines to transport the electricity from the power plants to our homes. This process can be very expensive in the order of billions of dollars. Some of those expenses ultimately get reflected in our monthly electricity bills. And if there's not enough electricity to meet our needs, that could mean multiple rolling blackouts in the incredibly hot Texan summer months. My dissertation uses a novel method to analyze the combined effect of load shifting, solar panels, and batteries on reducing peak residential electricity demand. Load shifting refers to shifting the usage of certain appliances, like charging an electric vehicle or running a dishwasher to times of the day other than the peak evening hours, or programming our thermostat to pre-cool our home in the afternoon so that once we get home from work, we don't have to blast our air conditioning systems. Some electric companies offer high prices in the evening hours and low prices at night to encourage this customer behavior of load shifting. In addition to load shifting, we can use solar panels to generate solar electricity during the day when the sun is shining. Some of that electricity can be stored in batteries to be used at night or on cloudy days when the sun is not shining brightly. My research shows that time-varying or dynamic electricity prices can reduce peak load. However, they can have the negative outcome of encouraging all customers to shift usage of majority of their appliances to the low price nighttime hours, thus creating a second peak in these nighttime hours. Further, my research also shows that although the price of residential batteries are still very high at the present time, we can and should be investing in solar, solar panels, which together with load shifting can help us reduce peak load, keep our electricity bills low, and prevent outages or blackouts.
And timekeepers, if you did you announce the times? What was the time on that one? It was 12 seconds was remaining on that one. Okay, thank you. And I also should have said, if you don't have to stay and watch everybody, I encourage you to if you can. If you need to go, you can go and come back at 12.15. If you can't be here at 12.15, um, we will email you and tell you if you've moved on to the final, okay? Thing is oh, just, just a sec. I'm sorry. Go ahead and start over. I'm waiting on one more judge. Sorry about that. Okay, all three of you ready? Do you think it is common for older adults to have daily contacts with friends? You might think that older adults only maintain contacts with their family, but recent study finds that on average, older adults we report having contact with a friend at least once per week. Current literature also suggests that daily experiences with social partners are associated with older adults' well-being. But these prior studies focuses on social partners broadly or just family ties. Friendships are indeed among the most important relationships in late life. But we know very little about the effect of daily encounters with friends. Therefore, my research focuses on the emotional well-being in older emotional experiences in older adults' daily encounters with friends. But are all friends equally important to an individual? For example, close friends, less close friends. I wasn't sure either. Therefore, I also consider closeness of friendships in my study by looking at, by asking whether encounters with close friends have a greater influence on older adults' well-being compared to less close friends. I used the data from the daily well experiences and well-being study collected in 2016 to 2017. We recruited 313 adults aged 65 and older who reside in Greater Austin, Texas area. Participants reported their experience encounters with different social partners such as spouses, other family members, friends, um, strangers every three hours across five to six days using Android devices. They also indicated the pleasantness of these encounters, any stressful experiences with this partner and their mood. Findings revealed that encounters with friends were the most pleasant among all social encounters. Older adults also report fewer stressful experiences with friends compared to with their spouses or family members. Encounters with friends were also associated with better mood. Though surprisingly, this link held specifically for friends who were not considered close. This could be due to the potential novel, fresh experiences with next close friends compared to more routine activities or less exciting experiences with close friends who are just like our close family. In sum, my study suggests that friendships are important in the current generations of older adults, and they do so by increasing levels of positive experiences encountered in daily life. In other words, maintaining daily contact with friends is a great thing that we should all do when we get old. Thank you.
Okay, is everybody, are judges, are we all ready? Yep. Alexander Fleming, the discoverer of penicillin, had said in his 1945 Nobel lecture that a time may come when the ignorant man can easily underdose himself on penicillin and by exposing his own microbes to these non-lethal quantities, make them resistant. Seventy years later, we're living in the era of antibiotic-resistant bacteria, commonly called superbugs. And while these originated in South Asian countries like India and China, these have over the years spread all over the world, affecting millions, and the last death count worldwide stood at seven, uh, 700,000. By 2050, it's estimated to reach 10 million people. And one of the main reasons being that these superbugs are actually evolving way faster than which scientists can develop drugs. So what is it about superbugs that makes them resistant? It's a class of proteins, one of which is the New Delhi metallobeta-lactamase that originated in the Indian capital and hence the name. There are a couple of things I want to tell you about NDM. First, as the name suggests, it has a metal and this metal plays a key role in a chemical reaction that makes the antibiotic ineffective. The second thing is in the 11 years since its discovery, there have been more than 25 evolutions of NDM and not a single clinically approved drug. So what are we doing and how are we approaching this problem? Well, we're making fluorescent switches, just like a fluorescent switch that will turn on and light up this room except in our case, we're using these fluorescent switches to light up NDM in superbugs. And this has been pioneering for two ways. First, it has allowed us to easily sense normal bacteria to these superbugs. So with a flip of a switch, now we can track superbugs clinically. The second, more important thing that it's allowed us to do is understand NDM and study it further. So if you see the image on the right corner, uh, you see some of them are much brighter spots than the rest. That's where the NDM resides. And now by understanding the origin of NDM, by looking at the effects of the environment on the NDM, we can now hopefully achieve uh, cures and develop therapies that are targeted towards NDM. We hope that these basic understandings would allow people in future to develop cures to target this superbug epidemic. Thank you. Seven million people living in the central U.S., including you and me, are now in danger of earthquakes. The earthquakes that are triggered by us. By us, I mean the petroleum companies. You guys are cool. <laughs> in 2009, the petroleum industry started to use a new method of extracting oil from the reservoirs called fracking. It was faster, stronger, and more efficient. However, the chart behind me shows that we had a gigantic jump in the number of earthquakes exactly the same time that this technology was developed. Why? Because in fracking, along with the oil, you get tons of wastewater out too, which is not very useful for petroleum companies. So what they do is to put the wastewater back where they found it, injecting it deep in the ground. When the water is injected close to a fault, it can cause the fault to move and then boom, an earthquake happens. Here is an example of how one of these earthquakes destroyed a building in Oklahoma. That could very well happen to our homes. 
needless to say, our structures and homes in this part of the country are no way near being ready for these earthquakes, since we never had to deal with them. So how do we deal with this ticking time bomb without knowing when, where, and how it's going to go up? What if we could predict their intensity before they happen? What if we could predict their potential damage beforehand too? If we had that knowledge, we might have been able to save that house. We might be able to save thousands of lives, millions of dollars in the future. Well, I may have some of the answers to these what ifs in my research. Regarding the intensity, I developed a model to predict the severity of the earthquakes on the horizon here in the central US. The model indicates that these earthquakes could be even more severe than what we expect in California, the infamous earthquake capital of the US. As for the potential damage of these earthquakes, I created computer models to see how different types of structures like homes and bridges behave during these earthquakes. One of the test results indicates that for a single, mo a single moderate magnitude earthquake with a magnitude of 5.8 in Dallas, Texas could cost $200 million of loss to highway bridges alone. It's almost half of the state's annual budget for constructing new bridges. So I propose a calculated method to identify the most susceptible structures to this imminent danger. By identifying and retrofitting them, we could prevent these earthquakes from becoming catastrophes with a minimal cost. I'm excited that my research is now being used by the Texas Department of Transportation. It's my hope that this will encourage my peers and people in decision-making positions to get more involved in solving the earthquake problem, which is a danger for all of us. Thank you. Sure, thank you. Is Cody here? Cody? No. So Cody's not here. Not here. Okay. Judges, are we ready? Building a sustainable future, co optimizing community energy and water, transportation and power. So, as things are going right now, um, community energy is improving. California has a new law where all new construction has to have household solar panels on it. And this is a picture in Big Ben. I see it's nice little solar panels that power that building. If you see in the back, that's a rainwater harvester. So they use that power to pump water uh, to that tank, to the building. Uh, vehicles are also electrifying. It's an electric bus. Probably the most prevalent example on campus are scooters and e-bikes. You see those around, but they are electrifying the last mile. Power. Uh, clean energy has outpaced coal, finally. So that's also good and more... Uh, niche technologies like geothermal and hydro are expanding as well. However, transportation is still mostly petroleum, 26 quads of it, and then it wastes 22 of it. Most car trips are under four miles, so instead of walking, biking, or using anything else that's cleaner, we take our cars. Power. While clean energy does outnumber coal, most of that clean energy is nuclear, and we're still very much a natural gas nation. And residential commercial power is powered mostly by natural gas as well. So how are, oh, one more. The nice little picture of Houston flooded. There's almost no rainwater harvesting. So instead of using rain to uh, give us more clean water when we're in a drought, it's now a liability. So how are shifting paradigms and transportation going to help us build a sustainable future? When will renewables? outpace the dirtier sources in cost and production, will, is distributed resources like solar PV on your rooftop, when is, is it better than using the centralized source, and how are all these things connected, transportation and power, and energy and water. So my research, what I do, I collect data, uh, usually from databases, they use smart meters and whatnot, 
I process that data using techniques like machine learning. I analyze that data using OR techniques like optimization and Monte Carlo simulation. And then I make visualizations. Not this one, this was from Lawrence Livermore, but like that. So you can see these conclusions. My research has shown that shared autonomous vehicles, which is like an Uber pool, but you know, drives itself, will influence car, uh, cars to electrify, which is helpful because my research also shows that we're shifting to renewables because they're cheaper. It's a slow transition, but it's happening. And then also that distributed resources on a community scale are better than getting cheap electricity from city of Austin, which is about 10 cents a kilowatt, and cheap water from the city of Austin. And when you get do both together, those benefits combine and become better. So eventually I wanna give these findings to decision makers on the state, national, and local level so that we can show that building a sustainable future is not only feasible, but profitable. What if I told you to picture the author behind this book? You might picture someone older, distinguished, respectable. After all, who else would choose to bind their book in black leather with gold decorations? What if I were to tell you that this book was a Bible? Regardless of what you think about the contents, you're probably thinking about authors who are ancient and authoritative enough to have their ideas transmitted throughout history. What if I were to tell you that this book contained fan fiction, a genre of literature characterized by its use of characters, plots, and other story elements from previously written works? What if I were to tell you that this book contained ancient biblical fan fiction? It was this dilemma that was faced by a German scholar in the 19th century named Johann Albert Fabricius, who collected ancient stories about Jesus and his disciples um, where they uh, met new people, went new places, and in, uh, did more miracles. However, he knew that he didn't want to call this text Bible, so instead he put it into a different category and called it Christian Apocrypha instead. Now this distinction has had a severe impact on how these materials are studied. Throughout the centuries, these authors have been characterized as everything from misguided fools to dangerous heretics set out to destroy Christianity. My work seeks to recast these authors as fans instead, people who cared enough about the work to rework and remix the traditional stories into new stories of their own. Now, modern Christian Apocrypha scholars already use fan fiction as an analogy to teach their undergraduate courses. However, what they don't know is that fan fiction studies is uniquely positioned to address stigmatized authors and literature. Picture the fan fiction author that I told you to think about at the very beginning of this presentation. Fan fiction authors are traditionally seen as inferior to and less authoritative than traditional ones. And so fan fiction studies must work against those biases in order to take the subjects of the stories and the authors who write them seriously as subjects of scholarship. My work seeks to combine the study of Christian Apocrypha with the study of fan fiction in order to destigmatize this entire body of literature and the authors who wrote them. These are fans, people who loved the literature enough to create new stories, stories in which uh, Jesus was able and his disciples were able to meet new people and do more miracles. Thank you.
energy growth is directly related to well-being and prosperity. And in this time, the only thing that we know for sure is like we need energy to support social and economic growth, especially in developing countries. For developed countries, energy provides uh, services that enrich and en enhance life. For in developing countries, the access to affordable and efficient energy is more fundamental. In this country, energy provides uh, support for uh, agriculture, for industry. It also improves the transportation, and additionally, uh, it increases trade. And these are the fundamental blocks to help people to escape from poverty and increase the quality of life. Uh, according to the International Energy Agency, 55% um, of the energy mix of the, uh, of the world is coming from hydrocarbons. That means that we consume um, a lot of uh, petroleum and natural gas. So, um, and the tendency is that we are going to keep uh, consuming hydrocarbons for the long term. Um, so we as petroleum engineers use reservoir simulations to evaluate reserves and also to estimate the number of wells that we need to produce more hydrocarbons and make uh, forecasts about production. Uh, the main challenge with reservoir simulations is that they are very time consuming and sometimes uh, we need to, to run several uh, scenarios to determine what is the optimal location of a well. So uh, the complexity behind reservoir simulations is that we need to model the complicated relationships between the oil and gas molecules at different conditions of pressure and temperature. And these are very time consuming calculations that has to be performed several times or thousands of times within us, a reservoir simulation. In that sense, my thesis uh, topic was how we can make these simulations faster and without losing accuracy. So we implemented artificial neural networks. That is an algorithm that resembles the human brain. An artificial neural network contains neurons, and also it makes connections between other neurons within the network. So at the human weight, we need to train an artificial neural network to make predictions. So we train our, our artificial neural network about how molecules of gas and oil behave in different conditions of pressure and temperature. And when we substitute uh, the most fundamental but time-consuming section over compositional reservoir simulations with an artificial neural networks, making it more faster and efficient to calculate. In that sense, we have more freedom to run more uh, possible uh, scenarios to develop all fields in a more efficient way and provide more energy to the world. Thank you. Twenty-five percent of Americans have a fear of public speaking. That's almost 82 million people. And that's a shame because communication is so important, especially in the corporate and the academic worlds. It turns out it doesn't matter so much what you say, it's how you say it. And that's what my research focuses on, how you say it, specifically with regard to filler words, words like ah uh and um. If I ah uh, said um a filler word every other word, it would make my presentation less clear, less concise, and less engaging. But people don't use filler words on purpose, and oftentimes they aren't even aware they're doing it. And that's the problem. I used to play this game in high school, where I'd sit in a big circle with a group of friends, and any time someone said a filler word, someone would clap. Make some sort of auditory cue to make that person more aware. And once you're more aware, and you can realize it, you can start practicing and reduce the number of filler words you say over time. But the problem is you can't always have someone following you around clapping every time you say a filler word. So I thought, what if I could build a computer program that could do this, a sort of virtual public speaking assistant, so that you can practice with it, and it can tell you any time you say a filler word in real time. Speech-to-text systems exist already. If you pull out your phone right now and go into your notes app, you can speak into your phone, and it can write down everything you say. Well, almost everything. 
If you say a filler word, it actually filters that out because we don't want those in the transcription. So I have the opposite problem. I want to take only the filler words when everything else is getting rid of them. So I decided I need to build some sort of custom model for this. I decided to approach this as a wake word problem. A wake word is a phrase like, hey Alexa, or okay Google, something that typically gets a smart device in your home to start listening to you. And I thought, why not apply this same sort of technology and recognition to filler word detection? I found a data set called the Buckeye Corpus. This is a data set of conversational speech, people talking back and forth, just having conversations. And those conversations can include filler words. I took all this data and I fed it into something called a neural network. This is a fancy piece of software that can essentially take this data and learn patterns. So for example, if someone says a filler word, the underlying audio signature, the neural network can operate on that itself. And it turns out, after training up this model, it does really well. It's able to recognize around 90% of the filler words said. And furthermore, it's not just for English. This model is general enough that you can train it on other filler words as well. In Japanese, the filler words are eto and ano, the analogs to am and a in English. And by getting a data set of those filler words in that language, you can train this model and teach it to recognize those words as well. I love public speaking. And my hope is that those 25% who are a bit nervous when it comes to it can take this model, can practice with it, increase their confidence, and begin to love public speaking too. Thank you. Every cancer patient who undergoes chemotherapy is at risk of developing a side effect of chemotherapy known as neutropenia. Neutropenia is a significant reduction of the white blood cells in the body. Now, a certain class of drugs known as granulocyte colony stimulating factors, GCSFs, are useful in preventing neutropenia as well as reducing its duration and severity. The American Society of Clinical Oncology, known as ASCO, recommends prophylactic use of GCSFs in patients with high risk of neutropenia. However, ASCO also recommends using viable alternatives in place of GCSF. So what is the research problem? The problem is that while GCSFs are effective in the management of neutropenia, they are expensive and they lead to clinical cost implications. Also, current studies recommend that GCSFs are being used outside of clinical practice recommendations. However, there is no evidence that GCSFs are useful in patients with metastatic cancers. So the thought process behind the study was, instead of administering GCSFs to patients with metastatic cancers, why not try chemotherapy dose reduction, which simply means reducing the dose of chemotherapy in order to reduce the risk of neutropenia, an approach that can lead to cost savings for both the patients and the payers. So the aim of the study was to answer two research questions. If we introduce an intervention, what will be the impact of this intervention on GCSF prescription patterns and also how do physicians comply to ASCO guidelines on GCSF use? So how did we do this? For this study, we obtained data retrospectively from the electronic health records of colorectal cancer patients who were metastatic and who received chemotherapy during two time periods, a pre-period and a post-period. Then we introduced an intervention, which was a program initiative with three steps. One, sending educational materials to all oncologists ASCO guidelines. Two, recommending that they introduce chemotherapy dose reduction to these patients instead of administering GCSFs. And thirdly, requiring prior authorization to all GCSF recommendations. Then the analysis assess the impact of these program initiatives on GCSF use and also on compliance to ASCO guidelines on GCSF use. So what did we find? We found that at baseline there was a 13% rate of GCSF use in this population, which may be high for a metastatic population. We also found that compliance to ASCO guidelines was significantly higher in the post-period compared to the pre-period, and we found that GCSF use was significantly lower in the post-period compared to the 
pre period. So what does this all mean? This means that the program initiative is impactful in reducing the prescription patterns of GCSF use, and we hope that this findings would lead to physicians adopting a cost-effective approach for this population, which could lead to improved clinical practice as well as value-based care. Thank you. Okay, this slide means that the uh, judges are going to go into the top secret secured room and deliberate. Um, we will be announcing their decision in about an hour. You have an hour. You don't have to come back. You're welcome to. Um, if you are moving on to the next round and you're not here, uh, we can email you or text you if you just want to leave us uh, your number. Okay? So hopefully I'll see all of you back here uh, in an hour.